Jamie, and I can't play guitar. Welcome back to I Can't Play Guitar. We've been away for a little bit. We apologize. We said we would be every day and practicing, which we have been. Uh, we've been learning how to play the guitar, working through Orange Amps, and Justin Guitar's beginning guitar courses, which are both free. Orange Amps is free right now, or if you buy an Orange Amp, it's free. Um, really good beginner course that I like. Uh, luckily, I had the the good fortune of taking uh, music lessons uh, and band lessons all throughout uh, public school, so uh, I had a bit of a <coughs> bass laid down. I can play drums as well, but um, I think for a lot of people, their more traditional approach um, with the side-by-side -side, uh, is pretty good because there's a lot of documentation that Justin Guitar doesn't have. Um, Justin Guitar can kind of feel a little haphazard, and Orange is very structured in comparison. Um, so I think that's good to use Justin Guitar as like almost a supplementary, um, and that's what we're doing. But what we've really been doing is just pounding out a ton of chords. And that's what we're going to do. Um, I don't even have my fret cam hooked up, so I'm not really going to be doing anything super interesting. I've basically just been um, watching YouTube videos and forcing myself. I watch a lot of YouTube, and I've been watching a lot of guitar history, trying to educate myself um, while I've been playing, because I, I, I find it hard to read and play. Um, but and go over a lot of chords while I watch stuff. And just getting in a lot of repetitions, making sure my fingers are correct. <laughs> So if we've never talked about it, or we, we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but we haven't talked about it too much, the fact that we um, are going to, let's see here. So we haven't talked too much about it, but um, we do use GarageBand as our like digital audio workstation. And you don't have to use GarageBand, but if you have a Mac, um, you basically have like a built-in audio processor that you can use for your guitar. Uh, you're kind of missing out if you're not fucking around with it. If you've never fucked it, if you fucked around with it, you don't like it, or you already know for whatever reason you don't like it, that's cool. But um, it's essentially like one of those big boss pedals um, but more powerful and if you ever see someone at a gig that has like a guitar and a piano and all that shit plugged in that's like they're running something like this and this has been the standard for years I think even Radiohead um, Johnny Greenwood and like Tom York were using some primitive forms of this when uh, GarageBand first came out um, I know there's been a lot of big name musicians who have fucked around on it. And at the end of the day, if it sounds good, it is good. It supports just as much stuff.
jamming on this. Check this out. Let me get a little more reverb. A little more space. adjusted that pickup and oof. So yeah, well really what I've been doing is going over chart, ch chord charts, doing chord changes, and watching YouTube videos. So that's actually that's just what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna check something out. Um, you guys can check it out with me if you want, and I'm gonna play chord changes. Um, let me pull up. If you guys are learning, don't worry. I have made so much progress in the last week, it's crazy. I'm sure to... walked out on the whole instrument over this and that's not bad that's an F
our chords too. So we've been we've been chewing up a lot. Um, slides are tough as shit so you just gotta just do them and the problem is you might make like very little progress for hours so just do them just hang out on them just enjoy the ones you do get up first though. Thank you. 
Watch a video and hang out and play some chord progressions. Hang out with us. Give me one second. My dogs are freaking out and I gotta go help comfort them. There's uh, a lot of fireworks being set off by our neighbors. Be right back.
right, we're back. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to Five Art World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. Leo Fender did not invent the electric bass guitar any more than he invented the solid body electric guitar with the Telecaster. But he did create the first commercially viable instruments, setting the bar for all to come after. This is never more true than the precision, or P-Bass. I'm going to take us through the history of the P-Bass from its roots to its current day and touch on some of the players that have figured large in that story. Take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. If you've already subscribed, swing by the store, grab a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. There's a link in the description. The P-Bass came out in October of 1951, though it wasn't officially launched until the summer NAMM show in 1952. The P-Bass was a dramatic step forward in electric bass design. Before the P-Bass, there were a small number of other upright-style electric basses. Perhaps the best known was Rickenbacker's electric bass viol, a solid stick that went directly into the top of its amplifier. In 1936, Paul Tutmark, a maker of lap steel guitars in Seattle, introduced a solid body, fretted electric bass guitar designed to be played in a horizontal position. Tutmark tried again in 1947, but neither design took off. It's debated whether Leo Fender was aware of Tutmark's bass, but there is no question that the P bass has very little in common with anything that came before. Along with Leo's famous statement about wanting to free the bass player from the big doghouse in the back of the band, he also had in mind guitarists looking to get more work by doubling on bass. Leo was famous for working with local musicians in and around Fullerton, California, to help shape his ideas into instruments. From this research, Leo learned that dance bands were getting smaller in the late 1940s, and guitarists believed they were missing out on work. Learning the upright bass, with its high action and lack of frets, seemed daunting, so Leo began musing about creating a fretted bass that would be held like a guitar. Okay, the first P right. bass had much in common with its smaller cousin, the Telecaster. It featured the same slab-sided ash body with a bolt-on maple neck. The prototype had tuning machines which were sourced from an upright bass and it had gut strings wrapped in steel. But the production instruments sported Klusen tuners and Fender had ordered flat wound strings from the VC Squire Company. The ash body was finished in the same pale yellow as the broadcasters, later named Telecasters, of the same year. The body had two cutaways, the first Fender design of that kind that gave the large body better balance. The upper horn extended up to the 12th fret so the guitar would hang evenly on a strap. The cutaways also reduced the overall weight. The shape ultimately gave the Fender ideas that would make it into the Stratocaster guitar. Another shared aesthetic from the early Telecasters was a black plastic pickup. The original pickup was a simple single coil, much like the Telecaster pickups, with a pull piece under each string, and it had two knurled knobs controlling volume and tone. Leo's original goal was to recreate the sound of an upright bass. He thought if it was going to be accepted, then it would need to properly substitute for that role in the band. So the Fender included a mute in the bridge cover to create a more dead and short note. And the bridge used two pressed carbon saddles that didn't yield a large amount of sustain. The large cover over the bridge and pickup were there to help with shielding. Also like a telly, the strings passed through the body and over the bridge. The thumb rest was set below the strings because Leo assumed that players would rest their fingers there and pluck the strings with their thumb. By all accounts, it sounded like the loudest upright bass you ever heard. The 20 fret neck was chunky like early Telecaster necks and had a Telestyle headstock to hold the tuners and a round string retainer for the D and G strings. The specifics of deciding on the scale length of the bass is still debated. According to Richard Smith, perhaps the authority on Leo Fender and author of Fender, The Sound Heard Around the World, Leo used information he found in a physics textbook that belonged to a secretary of Fender named Elizabeth Hazlett, who was a student at UCLA, to come up with the 34 inch scale. George Fullerton, Leo's early business partner, said it was more a matter of trial and error. We tried some shorter scales, like 30 and 32 inches, but they didn't seem to get the resonance we needed. The 34 inch scale also falls halfway between the 25 and a half inch of Fender's Telecaster and the 40 inch scale of most upright bases. Irrespective of how they figured it out, 34 inches has since become the scale of choice for the majority of bass guitars. One of Fender's marketing choices as part of their plan to entice guitar players was that it would be tuned E, A, D, G, one octave below standard tuning of the four lowest strings on a guitar. Also according to Smith, Leo chose the name precision bass because the frets made the intonation more precise than that of an upright bass. Okay. But the name also referred to the precise or focused tone of the instrument and 
the way the bases were being manufactured at Fender's factory, being made on machines, being more precise than the hand tools of traditional luthiers. All of this can be seen in the patent for ornamental design submitted by Leo for the P-Base in November of 1952, which was later granted in March of 1953. Once all the details have been worked out, the first P-Bases went on sale for $199.50. Leo knew that the Rickenbacker electric upright had been sold with a purpose-built amplifier, and he knew that his guitar amplifiers were not up to the job of reproducing the lower frequencies. So he set to work designing what would be the first Fender bass pedal. The ad stated, especially designed for bass reproduction. It had a 15-inch speaker and produced about 26 watts, enough power to create what we would now think of as low to medium volume. While this wattage seems tiny compared to modern bass amps, in the 50s this was a big step forward and the amplifier was often sold with the bass. But Leo had hopes of seeing his P bass adopted by a country artist in Southern California. And there is an account of Joel Price playing an early P-Bass at the Grand Ole Opry in 1952. The overall reception of Leo's bass guitar, much like the response to the first broadcaster, was altogether lackluster. The first big break came from a very unlikely place, jazz. Leo was traveling the country promoting his instruments and stopped at a nightclub performance of vibraphonist Lionel Hampton's band in New York. There he had a chance to meet Hampton and his bass player at the time, Roy Johnson. Though the reception of the bass from the crowd at the club was not favorable, Hampton himself really liked the sound, and Leo told him he could keep the bass. In an issue of Downbeat Magazine from July of 1952, Leonard Feather reported, Suddenly, we observed that there was something wrong with the band. It didn't have a bass player, and yet we heard bass. Feather went on to praise the sound of the P bass as having a deep, booming quality. The bass, its volume turned up a little above normal, cut through the whole bottom of the band like a surging undertow. Dusty Hill of ZZ Top is probably the best known player of the 51 to 54 Blackguard P basses, using them to this present day. By 1951, big band's popularity was starting to wane, and small groups were on the rise. Jump blues, which later led directly to rock and roll, was a fertile ground for a full sounding low end. Still, the P bass was more of a novelty than a fixture by the mid 50s, so Leo continued to tweak his bass to try to reach more players. The first significant changes came in 1954. First, they changed to a two-tone sunburst finish. According to George Fullerton, Fender did not consider the tonal differences between Ash and Alder to be a big factor, and so they didn't begin using Alder for the sunburst bodies until 1956, due to a difference in cost. The top and back contours of the body that were designed into the Stratocaster were added to the P bass as well. The 54 and 55 basses might have either a black or a white pick guard, but by 1956, the only the white guards were being used. The pickup's pole pieces were changed to more closely follow the radius of the fingerboard. And also in 1954, the press fiber saddles were replaced with steel. The location of the serial number was somewhat fluid between 54 and 56, sometimes appearing on the neck plate and other times on the bridge plate. Of these early basses, one of the most famous belongs to Sting, who used his favorite 54P bass until it was eventually replaced for road work by a Fender Custom Shop replica. By the mid-50s, Fender had hired Forrest White and Freddie Tavares to help oversee production and design. These staffing changes at Fender allowed Leo to do what he liked best, subtly improve his designs. And this brought about the next and most lasting changes to the P-Base. In 1957, the new split-coil pickup design was implemented. They were hum-canceling, making the bass quieter. The two magnets per string design lowered the magnetic string pull and improved the tone and output of the pickup. The headstock was changed to mimic the shape of the Stratocaster as well. Some believe that the additional mass increased sustain and helped eliminate dead spots on the neck. The bridge was modified to have four individually adjustable saddles to provide more adjustment for string height and intonation. The bridge was changed to a top loader design where the strings no longer passed through the body and it was attached to the body with five screws instead of the previous three. A new one-piece pick guard in gold anodized aluminum was designed to encompass the pickups and hold all the electronics, volume, tone, and input jack. The control knobs were switched from rounded to flat top. There was a cutout in the pick guard, and the pickup was mounted directly to the body. The covers for the pickup and bridge were redesigned to fit with the rest of the changes. Like the other guitars in the Fender line, the neck started to have a soft V shape. Finally, the thumb rest, previously wood and mounted with one screw, was changed to plastic and attached with two screws. 1957 also saw the marketing of custom DuPont Duco finishes for an upcharge. Custom colored P bases listed for $230, while the standard sunburst finish listed for 
$19.50. Elvis Presley's bassist Bill Black settled into using a P bass and famously introduced the sound to millions on the 1957 hit Jailhouse Rock. Many consider this the first major hit featuring the sound of an electric bass guitar. As dance bands continued to become smaller, the sound of the electric bass was a driver in making that revolution possible. According to Quincy Jones, who was dividing his time between big band, jazz, and pop arranging at the time, quote, it really changed the sound of the music because it ate up so much space. Before the electric bass and the electric guitar, the rhythm section was the support section, backing up the horns and the piano. But when they were introduced, everything upstairs had to take a back seat. The rhythm section became the stars, all because of this technological development. In 1958, Chicago blues man Dave Myers began using a P bass, and after blowing up two guitar amps, he finally got a basement amp and started using it at gigs. Myers reported that the audience response was immediate. They would be standing up on chairs and going wild. That's when I knew I really had something going with that Fender bass. After the major overhaul in 57, the changes in the next couple of years were more subtle. 1958 saw the introduction of the three-tone sunburst, and 1959 featured the new rosewood fingerboards, discontinuing the solid maple neck by 1960. And they replaced the gold anodized guard with a plastic tortoiseshell style with metal shielding on the back, and the pick guard went from having 10 screws to 13. The late 1950s saw an America that was still profoundly racially divided in its listening habits. Jailhouse rock might have been in the introduction, but it was likely the surf music of the early 60s that cemented the sound of the electric bass, and hence the P bass, in the minds of the young white audience, not yet hip to electric blues coming out of Chicago. Though other electric basses were around by then, it was seen as a sign of having made it to have a P bass in the lineup. The trend continued as the British invasion, influenced by both Chicago blues and surf music, started accelerating. The success of these bands, first in the UK and then in the States, demanded more volume than was possible with an upright bass. The electric bass gave bass players a larger role, using different patterns that became integral to the music. This would not only impact how the music was being performed, but also, eventually, how the music was being written. It isn't an exaggeration to say that P bass is dominated from the mid-50s to the mid-70s. There were so few changes in the P bass during the 60s that the pictures used in the Fender catalog weren't even updated every year. Whether it was Motown, Sax Bolt, Chicago Blues, or New York City, the P-Bass was everywhere on records and in performances. The early 60s also saw the rise of studio musicians using the P-Bass. In 1963, session guitarist Carol Kay played a P-Bass on a session when the scheduled bass player failed to show. Within a year, she was the number one studio bass player in Los Angeles, playing on hits including the Beach Boys' Good Vibrations and Simon and Garfunkel's Homeward Bound. Her standard rig was a P bass, strung with medium gauge strings, which she played with a pick. Of course, the bassist that casts the longest shadow of all is James Jamerson, often simply referred to as St. James. He played on dozens of Motown hits using his 1962 P bass, known as the Funk Machine. It was completely stock, with the pickup cover and foam string mute still in place. It was strung with labella flatwounds, used by so many, the action was quite high, likely because Jamerson had started out an upright. Sadly, the bass was stolen near the end of his life and has never been recovered. Another studio giant, Chuck Rainey, credited Jamerson as his main influence. He was a first call session player from the mid-60s onward, playing his 57P bass on literally hundreds of sessions, including Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, and Aretha Franklin. His work on Steely Dan's classic Asia stands the test of time and is the record Rainey cites as his own personal favorite. Sax Bolt session great Donald Duck Dunn was one of the great ambassadors for the P-Bass. He got his first P-Bass when he was just 16 years old, and throughout his life he always referred to the sunburst with a one-piece maple neck as a 58. But after his death, his son had some work done on the bass, and the neck was marked April of 59. He later played a 59 P-Bass that was almost identical, except that it had been fitted with a rosewood fretboard neck. He too used heavy labella flatwound strings like his hero Jamerson. In 1998, Fender produced a signature instrument based on a late 50s style P with a maple neck and gold anodized pickguard in his favorite candy apple whip finish. There were, of course, subtle changes that followed along with others in Fender history. The logos changed from the original spaghetti logo to the blockier logo with patent numbers added in 1964. This is now known as the transition logo because it was used right before the sale of Fender to CBS in 65. Later that year, a large F appeared stamped on the neck plate that denotes the CBS years. And in 1966, there's an interesting curve in P-Bass history when a special bass was produced for the UK market. 
After an import ban on American instruments in the UK ended in 1959, the floodgates opened and players in Britain embraced the newly available Fender guitars and basses. The 66 UK Precisions echoed the first P bass style. They had a slab body and a black pickguard. This model is notable because John Entwistle of The Who played one in the earliest days of the band. Entwistle was also known to later play basses he put together with a Gibson Thunderbird body and a P bass neck that he liked to refer to as Fender Birds. In 66, production manager Forrest White also approved a new tuner that could be manufactured in-house at Fender. Generally referred to as paddle tuners, they were used until 1970. And now, if you'll allow for a slight digression, this is probably a good time to outline the history of a close cousin of the P-Bass. In 1968, the original precision bass design was reissued in the U.S. as the Telecaster bass. Like the 66 UK basses, it echoed many of the original appointments of the 51 P bass, with a strings through slab body and two saddle bridge. The pickguard was white rather than black, but the shape was like the originals, and the headstock controls were the same as well. Most of the necks were constructed with a separate maple fingerboard, but some were built with one piece maple necks. There was a good reproduction of the original single coil 50s pickup too. The logos were changing across this period, and this helps date the specific year of the basses, which were made for four years, from 1966 to 1972. In 1994, Fender Japan built a reissue 51 P bass, which was really a copy of the 68 to 72 Telecaster basses. These are still being built and have been joined by Mike Dern and Sting's signature models. But back to the traditional P bass history. During the 60s, Fender began by using a single ply nitrocellulose material for the pickguard. However, as it deteriorated, it gave off gases and it broke down, leading to corrosion of the metal parts. Fender switched to a single ply white plastic pickguard that were cut unbeveled to replicate the original one ply look. In 1970, Fender offered the first fretless version of the P bass. Despite the incredible impact of Jaco Pistorius later in the 70s, Fender didn't offer a fretless jazz bass until many years later. Black Sabbath bassist Geezer Butler famously wielded a P bass in the 70s playing a pair of pre-CBS precisions. And Francis Rocco Prestia played P-basses in the funk band Tower of Power, primarily known for playing his customized purple transparent American Deluxe with a split P-bass pickup that was reversed for a punchier tone. When Fender began doing natural finishes in the 70s, they moved back to using hat as the primary bodywood. The 70s also saw the beginning of three and four ply pickguards on the P-bass. Though custom colors were offered and might be popular among collectors today, players were still generally gravitating towards sunburst, black, and white instruments. Late in 1976, the serial number moved to the headstock, and the number generally denotes the year of manufacture. Founded in 1975, Iron Maiden's only constant member, Steve Harris, has been the foundation of the band, rocking his precisions. His original P bass, which he has played on every album, has gone through a number of refins over the years, from white to black to blue sparkle, and now white with the crest of the West Ham United Football Club. My vintage expert, Dave Honorado, would want me to include the details on original cases for P bases over time, so let me do that all in one place. From 1951 to 59, they were tweaked, and then, like Fender amps, were switched to brown Tolex until late in 1962, and then white in 1963 to early 64, and then black Tolex until 1978 when they changed to molded plastic, and that runs until the present. In 1980, Fender released the Precision Special with gold and brass hardware. Brass hardware was much in vogue in the late 70s and early 80s, as it was thought to increase sustain. In 1982, Bill Schultz was running Fender, and along with factory upgrades, they began doing vintage reissues in earnest. They issued both 57 and 62 P-Base replicas, authentic right down to the period correct pickguards and location of the thumb rests and their case colors. In addition to these reissues, they issued the first active P-Base with the 1982 version of the Precision Special and the Precision Base Special Walnut models, the latter of which had a beautiful matching walnut body and neck. Though the standard series bases retained their traditional passive circuitry, they did get the white pickup covers that had been added to the Precision Specials that year. In 1983, Fender issued the Elite Series P Base, which included new bridges, electronics, pickups, tuners, and a biflex truss rod. In 1985, CBS sold Fender to an investor group headed by Bill Schultz, and manufacturing was moved from Fullerton to Corona, California. According to employees at the time, most of the vintage reissue bases sold in 85 and 86 were put together from parts manufactured in 84 and 85 and had been in the warehouse. 
Schultz's new team produced the biggest change yet with the Precision Bass Plus in 1989. The 20-fret neck was replaced with a 22-fret version, which required stretching the top arm of the body to correct the balance. They used lace sensor pickups with a selector switch for series or parallel for the neck pickup and added a jazz bass pickup near the bridge, the first of the now common PJ's pickup configurations, to give the player the sound of both precision and a jazz bass in one instrument. The subsequent year's NAMM show saw the release of dramatically redesigned basses from Fender. Fender was looking towards the metal audience with downsized bodies and headstocks, as well as removing the pick guards entirely. By 94, Grunge had nearly replaced metal and aesthetics, and Fender returned to its more vintage sensibilities. John Sir was in the custom shop at the time, and he oversaw the development of new pickups and active circuits for the new deluxe series. There were also new body, neck, and wrist designs. The next were reinforced with graphite rods. Strings went back through the body. They added thicker peg heads for greater sustain, and a more accessible truss rod were all part of these changes. At the same time, American standards benefited from the graphite reinforced necks, but retained the 20 fret neck and a traditional body shape with a 9.5 radius figure and bigger jumbo frets. Passive electronics, they returned to the strength of the body as well. In many ways, they harkened back to the features you'd find on a late 50s or early 60s base. In 1997, maple fretboards were offered again, along with a deluxe fretless model. In 98, the deluxe series included new noiseless pickups from Bill Turner and they began to use a new lightweight tuning gear to improve balance. The deluxe sported Avalon dots to provide an upgraded look to the fretboard. The studio and touring legend Lee Scalar has been associated with many brands over the years. His favorite studio instrument is a modified P-Bass. It has an additional P-Bass pickup near the bridge, a 62 precision neck that was reshaped to a jazz bass dimensions, and then it was fitted with narrow mandolin fret wire for more precise intonation. Most recently, Pino Palladino has brought P-Bases back into the limelight. Likely, his biggest impact on the P-Bass world has come from his touring with the John Mayer Trio from 2005 to the present. Based on his favorite 61 and 63 P-Bases, there is a custom shop Palladino signature P-Bass in faded Fiesta Red finish with a tortoiseshell pickguard, just like the one he used with Mayer. From 99 to the present, we've seen an almost endless string of variations on a theme of the past. Different names, combinations of woods, fingerboard materials, colors, pickguards, tuners, bridges, and electronics coming from the custom shop, Fender US, Fender Japan, and the Squire line. And all are still immediately recognizable as P-Bass in looks and tone. Along with it being the first commercially viable bass guitar, the Precision is by far the most recorded electric bass in history, with only the Fender Jazz bass coming close. But that's the subject of another video. Three books in particular made this video possible. How the Fender Bass Changed the World by Jim Robbins. The Fender Bass, an illustrated history by J.W. Black and Albert Molinaro. And The Bass Book by Tony Bacon and Barry Morehouse. The books are linked in the description below. I'd like to thank bassist and composer Neil Elliott from Seville, Spain for writing and performing the P-Bass music for the video. See the link in the description to find more of his exceptional bass-centric writing. I'd also like to thank Dave Honorado of Dojo Guitar Repair and Plant. My vintage expert is always insightful help with this trip. If you enjoyed the video, throw us a like, and don't forget to subscribe, and check out the store for a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world. Alright, we gotta watch Jazz Bass. Introducing Player's Path, the step-by-step -step graded performance system for bass players. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're just going to help you get the most music from the least gear. Fender spent most of the 50s furiously innovating their electric guitar line. However, when it came to the electric bass, the pace of progress had been comparatively slow. As the P bass settled into its new split pickup identity by 57, Leo and company began to imagine a new deluxe bass guitar, which would become the Fender Jazz Bass. This is the 5 Watt World short history of the J bass. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. There's a link in the description. Much like the Stratocaster guitar being issued as an upscale guitar to the Telecaster, by 59, Fender was ready to release a bass in their lineup above the Precision. In standard sunburst finish, for the kingly price of $279.50, an incredible $2,422.57 in 2019 dollars. 
the world was introduced to the jazz bass. Though as it turns out, Fender had begun producing them in March of 1960. Don Randall, the head of Fender's marketing and distribution company, noted, They were always market-driven. After establishing the fact that bass guitars would sell and that people wanted them, then the next thing was to make a prettier one, a more elaborate one. We wanted an upscale model to put on the market. The jazz bass wasn't Leo's idea particularly. It was more of a marketing idea, something that we wanted in order to expand the line. So it was an idea that came out of Don Randall's marketing and sales division. And like the Stratocaster, it would be Randall that named the jazz bass. After considering the deluxe model, it was renamed in an attempt to appeal to jazz bass players. Ironically, and somewhat understandably, upright players often preferred the wider neck of the P bass when they moved over to an electric. Whatever the motivation, the jazz bass was an aesthetic evolution of the ideas started with the precision. Compared to the P bass, the jazz had a slightly larger body, made of alder, or occasionally of ash. The increased size means the jazz basses are often a little heavier, and that extra mass can provide more resonance. To feature the offset waves of the Jazzmaster guitar that Fender had launched as its new premier model in 58, making it more comfortable to play sitting down, as most serious players of the time tended to do. It also had a narrower string spacing at the nut, giving the neck a more tapered feel. The jazz bass was 1 and 7 sixteenths of the nut, whereas the precision was a full 1 and 3 quarters inches. Consequently, many guitarists switching over to bass felt the jazz bass neck was more manageable. But the biggest and most visible difference was that it had two pickups instead of one, providing tonal versatility not to be found on the pickups. The jazz bass prototype had large Sopar style single coil pickups, similar to those of a Jazzmaster guitar, but they didn't have the tone the Fender was looking for, so they were redesigned into familiar, narrower pickups with eight pole pieces, two per string, seen on the first production guitars. As a consequence of the phase...
guitars, the tonal consequences of reverse winding designed to cancel the hum of the 50s playing contributed directly to the voice of the instrument. While the neck pickup provided the warm round sound A son, once returned home from afar, gave to his father a gift. It was a gift of quality and purpose. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. We're into small amps, small pedals, and helping you find your tone. If it's your first time here, please consider subscribing. Recently, I was listening to Amps and Axis, a podcast here on YouTube, and David Grissom was on, and about 30 minutes in, he said this. I do I have to have sort of a fantasy about if you could just pare it down to one or two electrics, and one or two acoustics, and one or two amps. This is a question that's been on my mind ever since I started playing guitar. I grew up in a very rural part of upstate New York, and in my teen years, when I wasn't practicing guitar, I was out hiking or fishing. It was around this time that I heard a quote, beware the man with one gun surely he'll know how to use it. What's meant by this is that if you have one tool, you'll likely become very proficient with that one tool. I think this is the message of one guitar. So the question is, how many guitars do you need? Up next. <laughs> When I first discovered David Grissom, I found myself on his webpage. And at the time, he had a page devoted to just his electric guitars. I had a list of them, pictures and histories of each guitar. There was only about six guitars there. And this was at a time when I owned about 25 electric guitars. So I was thinking to myself, if David Grissom, who is the musical director at the time of the Dixie Chicks, who's toured with the Allman Brothers and Buddy Guy, who's been on his records, if he only needs six guitars, why do I need so many? And ultimately, once David Grissom came up with his PRS signature model, he really only did most of that music with one guitar. So how many guitars do you need? 90% of the time I'm playing electric guitar. So let's talk about that. How many electric guitars do you need? Before we get into it too much, let's just get this out of the way. In this society, we confuse the word need with want. We spend a lot of time talking about what we need when really we're talking about what we want. And certainly, the internet and YouTube even, all kinds of clips, are always telling us that we need a lot of electric guitars. We need a Telecaster, we need a Stratocaster, a Les Paul, a Gretsch, a 335, something quirky, something to play slide on, etc., etc. I have a friend that I've known for about 15 years. It took me about five years to find out that he actually played guitar. I questioned him about what kind of guitar he had, and he said it was a Stratocaster. But he really couldn't tell me more than that. He said it was a red guitar with a dark fingerboard. When I quizzed him about what years he bought it, etc., I finally put it together that it's probably a copy of a 60s Stratocaster, made in Japan. Actually, a quite sought-after guitar. With that one guitar, he's played in a band for three decades with friends of his from college. They play benefits, they play shows at clubs, they're a rock, R&B, soul kind of an outfit. And he's been very happy. When I asked him, you ever think about buying a second guitar? He just looked at me, perplexed, and he said, what for? So clearly the beginning of this answer is one. You need one guitar to get most of what we're out there trying to find. Now you might say, yeah, but that's just one guy. Just one example, you can come up with one example. And hey, Keith, you have a lot of guitars. So let's actually look, and we don't have to look very far into our heroes to find both deep and numerous examples of one guitar guys. Eric Clapton jumps to mind first. He's played different guitars through his career, but he seems to settle on one guitar for each band that he's in. He's sort of what I think of as a serial monogamist when it comes to electric guitars. And even though he's pretty much settled on strats around the time of Derek and the Dominoes, and he does pull out an old favorite, even when he does that, he plays it for the whole record, like on From the Cradle, where he plays a 335. And this is a guy that can choose to tour with any number of guitars he wants, and yet usually he stands up there and plays the whole show with just one Stratocaster. Jimmy Page famously played a Telecaster on the first few Led Zeppelin records, but once he got a Les Paul, he never looked back. The sounds of him coaxing Telecaster tones, but also huge humbucking tones from that Les Paul, is like the most iconic image in rock music. Him hunched over listening to the band, him 
just rocking that burst. B.B. King settled early on his signature ES-355. And though in many interviews he talks about himself as being a blues singer, I've lost count of the number of my influences who've said that B.B. King was the best at getting the most from the fewest notes. David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, another famous Stratocaster user, he gave his famous Black Strat to the Hard Rock Cafe. They hung it on the wall, and years later he went back and took it down, strapped it back on, and he's never really stopped. He's famous for saying that he thinks you can sound more like yourself playing single coil pickups. That's an amazing comment and really an incredible testament for his chosen guitar. Carlos Santana and his signature PRS guitar, which he got in the mid 80s, even before there was a PRS factory. I like Clapton, he's played different guitars over the years, but really he stays with one guitar at a time. And of course, Santana's always sounded like himself, no matter what guitar and amp he's using. Danny Gatt, he did it all on a Telecaster, and certainly showed us that you can get all the music you need from that one instrument. An instrument that Brad Paisley affectionately likes to call a cutting board with electronics. The recently deceased Malcolm Young, who played his Gretsch Jet Firebird and became the sound, it was the sound of ACDC. So much so that his brother Angus carried it to and from his funeral. It was the picture that all the news services seemed to pick up on and run. And of course, while we're in the neighborhood, the great Angus Young himself and his Gibson SG. Jeff Beck, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix, Grant Green, Clarence White, you get the idea. They all did it, or still do it, on just one style of guitar. So why try to do it with one guitar? The upside. First, you get to know the instrument. You get to know back and forward. We're back to the guy with one gun thing. You become familiar with the mechanics of that one guitar. String tension, string spacing, scale length, the output of the pickups, how it reacts to the amp, how it reacts with your pedal. Like most of you, I don't play guitar for a living. So when I can find time to practice, having something as simple as the same bridge on each of the guitars that I play, so that my right hand muting is the same, for example, can make a huge difference in my progress as a player. If we look back at our list of greats who played one guitar, they seem to develop a deep affinity and relationship with that instrument. Years ago, David Gilmore in an interview I heard said, when asked if he bent a string at a certain time in comfortably numb solo, he said he didn't know, and he probably didn't do it the same way every night. It might have been a string bend with his finger, but it might have been simply him pulling back on the vibrato bar, something he does almost unconsciously at this point, and because a Stratocaster sort of become part of his hands. It provides the chance for the instrument to almost disappear and have the music flow right out through the hands and out through the speakers. Variety of tone. People like Robin Ford are constantly asked, what effects do you use on this record? And he usually replies back, I use my hands. He gets all these different sounds by changing where he picks. And this, with both the tone and volume, generally, quote, all the way up, end quote. Same can be said for Nashville great Guthrie Trap, who wore the finish off the tone and volume knobs on his famous Callista Telecaster. He seems to subconsciously reach down and make sure that they're all the way up, getting all the variety of tone he needs from picking position. David Grissom, on the other hand, is famous for extolling the virtues of riding the volume knob, getting from a single channel amp his clean, crunch rhythm and lead tones without just a few pedals. Next, there's the economic reason. When I was first out of college, I worked in admissions and traveled on a fixed expense per diem. There was another guy who traveled about at the same time, and since I'd worked in restaurants in high school and in college, I liked good food, and I noticed that this guy was eating in all the best restaurants in the cities that we visited. Finally, I said to him, how can you can afford to do this on your expense budget? And he said, it's easy. You don't buy an app. You don't buy a cocktail. You get an entree. You don't get dessert. You don't get coffee. You don't get wine. You just get the entree. If you eat that way, you can pretty much eat anywhere you want. Now, as much as a first world sort of problem as that sounds, it really, I think, applies to this one guitar question. I find that's the same thing that's in my mind when I find myself on the internet cruising the Will Cut or Wildwood or Music Emporium sites, my right hand itching to click on the next Collins electric guitar that I come across. And I know that feeling is probably itching into your hands right now as I mention those sites. But let me remind you, when we're shopping for guitars, we're not playing guitar. It's worthy saying again, when we're shopping for guitars, we're not playing guitars. We're really not getting any better. When I'm on those websites, I think to myself, if I sold these three good guitars that I have, I could buy one of these. And then instead of playing good guitars, I could be playing one exceptional instrument, getting to know that instrument, and getting better on that instrument every day. I venture that this is why guys like Eric Clapton, David Gilmore, Jeff Beck played one guitar at the beginning of their career. Most of these
these people were from fairly meager economic backgrounds. They could really only afford to have one guitar at a time. I think kind of like the beginning of records, when you could only afford as a kid to buy one record at a time, and you play it for a month and burn it up. The fact is, I think these guys did the same thing. They'd get to know that instrument, and they would play that one instrument, knowing it inside and out. In Clapton's autobiography, he spends pages talking about when he could finally afford to buy his cherry red ES-335. The downside, each of us is different. What we need from an instrument is different. I've heard any number of players say that playing a different guitar makes them sound different. I heard this clip from Ed Koch just the other day from Wildwood. So I have a tendency to play, I play differently on the different guitars. Which is basically what other people have said. I myself always used to say it was the reason I owned 25 electric guitars was that each one had given me a song when I played it the first time. That playing that guitar made me able to hear something that I hadn't heard before. Or it might be that you're looking to do session work. You feel like you need something that would cover each category. In this, I'd also still argue that you could probably do it a lot with only a few instruments. Say a Telecaster, a Stratocaster, and something with humbucking pickups. I understand that producers probably say on occasion, I need a Les Paul on this, and you feel like you need to have a Les Paul. But really, I would chase this dragon for years. And I had to finally come to grips with the fact that I wasn't getting calls for studio work, and I wasn't likely to. So having one of each really wasn't something that I needed. Or it might be you're still looking for your tone. In Robin Ford's excellent Blues Revolution video on True Fire, he says that we are imitating, emulating, and listening to our heroes all the time. And really, that's how we find our way. We hear Mark Knopfler play a Stratocaster solo when we want to go get a Strat and try to start looking for that. Or we hear a Led Zeppelin tune on the radio and we want to go find a Les Paul. But really, that's us sounding like somebody else. I saw an interview with J.D. Simo recently where he said that the rig he took out on the road was really satisfying a fantasy of his to be like his heroes. And he wasn't really wrestling yet with the idea of sounding like himself. So how many guitars do you really need? Where are we in our search for tone? That's a question you're going to have to answer for yourself. And I imagine, like all deep questions, that answer will change over time.
took another video. This guy is fucking legit. Uh, videos. Video jet, we watched that. That's the only one we watched, sure. Welcome to Five Art World, where interested in helping get the most music from the least gear. The eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that I've played my Strandberg guitars in a couple of the recent videos. They certainly are noticeable in all their heads and certain amount of glory. There have even been a couple of cases where conversations with members of Five Art World led to them buying their own Strandbergs. You guys know me. I try to be a good influence. I was just sharing my experiences and, well, sometimes things get bought. I've always been fascinated by lightweight guitars. Okay, you might say obsessed with lightweight guitars, and over the years, some of my favorite players have played ergonomic guitars, most of which were outside my price range. But that changed in 2017 when Strandberg launched their classic line. And being fascinated with guitar history, they really had me when they released their homage to the solid body that started it all, the Telecaster, in 2018 with the Salen. I ordered two different Salen models, thinking I'd keep one. Maybe you see this coming, but I really like them both, so I kept both guitars, and to stay somewhat guitar neutral, I sold two guitars. Things escalated quickly. In short order, I ended up selling another guitar to buy one of their Bowdoin Classic models to cover the Stratty end of things. As any totally not obsessed person would do, I started learning everything I could about Strandberg guitars. Where did the company come from? When did they start? And what had inspired these supremely comfortable instruments? This video will be a little different, because along with the story, I can share my experience playing the guitars. So this is what I've learned so far, and this is the 5 Watt World Short History of Strandberg Guitars. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store to grab a t-shirt or a mug. There's a link in the description. Oh, and while I have your attention, we love to get pics of folks wearing our shirts and hoisting our mugs. Please email those to us via the website. Might end up in a video. Ola Strandberg had built his own guitars in the 1990s. Finding himself between jobs in the 2000s, he decided to build a new guitar. He once owned a headless honer guitar, much like the one I'm playing here back in 1991. So he knew that he wanted to build his own headless. But when he started looking around for hardware, it came up empty. Having experience in CNC and manufacturing, he decided to design and build his own. Around the same time, he'd come across an internet group of ergonomic guitar builders. He started posting on the forum and blogging about his build, getting feedback from the community about his ideas. This led to builders asking to buy his custom hardware. So he started producing small batches, increasing in size as demand grew. And while he was losing money on the hardware, he was learning the craft from the fundamentals. In the middle of 2009, he won Guitar of the Month for his one-off guitar build he'd posted on ProjectGuitar.com. Encouraged by the feedback, he decided to move ahead and build three more as test beds for different design concepts. Then, in 2010, Chris Lechner from the band Scale the Summit contacted him asking for a seven-string version of the guitar. He'd never done it. He didn't really even know about seven strings at all, but he said, sure. That was the fifth Strandberg custom guitar build. Rave doesn't even begin to describe it. Scale the Summit was out touring, and the guitar was getting seen by people like Tosa Navasi from Animals as Leaders. Players of extended range 7 and 8 string guitars were almost, by definition, more open to new designs, so they became Strandberg's first real market. While Ola built Letchford's guitar, he simultaneously built the second one alongside it, which he displayed at the Uppsala Guitar Festival. The ergonomics of the guitar had always been at the core of Ola's efforts, but at first he was hesitant to push the ergonomic angle of his marketing. He soon realized these product players were sometimes practicing for 16 hours a day, and repetitive stress injuries were a major concern in that world. So the ergonomics became a core of the appeal for these players, delivering on Strandberg's early marketing tagline, Feel better, sound better. In 2011, Abbasi got in touch with Ola. 
Tosin was known for playing eight string guitars in new and innovative ways, and a video clip of Tosin playing in the Strandberg booth at the 2011 NAMM show ended up generating 300,000 plus views on YouTube. Tosin ordered a custom guitar, and later that year, so too did Misha Mansour of Peru. Ola was still building all the guitars in his garage workshop, and by the time he'd bought a small CNC machine, he'd also needed to put his brand on the guitar somewhere. The logo is as intentional as the rest of the design. The dot signifies a seed of an idea, and the asterisk the flowering or innovation that results from planting that seed. The style of the body. You don't need space for a big workbench to have a great setup for working on guitars. Three great ideas come together to make this a compact workstation. The style of the body shape had yet to be named, though. Frankly, Ole has been too busy building guitars to come up with one. At the Uppsala Festival, a woman had exclaimed, the shape reminds me of Ranger Rantlers. So looking for names associated with reindeer, they found Boden, which is the name of a town in northern Sweden well known for reindeer farming. In 2012, Ola realized that he might be onto something that would extend beyond a hobby. The second custom guitar had been shipped to Japan and it received a lot of attention in that market, and orders had started to come in with increasing frequency. To paraphrase Spinal Tap, they were becoming big in Japan. By the end of 2012, Ola was building custom guitar number 33. Meanwhile, an equal number of guitars were being made under the supervision of Strandberg in Ohio. Inspired by the work of Luthier Jerome Little, and in consultation with Luthier Rick Toon, Ola settled on a neck design that has three planes on the back to guide your wrist to a comfortable position as you move up the neck. He filed a patent application in 2012 for what he calls the Endure Neck. In 2013, Ola built a custom Bowden six-string with true temperament frets for fusion master Alan Olsworth. Holsworth had played a Strandberg in 2012 and was hooked. Holsworth is known for using 20-inch or flatter radius fingerboards, and Ola told me that working with this dream customer accounts for that radius eventually being used throughout the line. However, the growth of the company's operations took Ola away from building, and eventually he could no longer keep up with the custom guitar orders. With over 250 orders on the waiting list, he realized something had to change. He handed over the building at the custom shop to Swedish luthier Leif Jacobson. Having now been to four NAMM shows, his networking started to pay off. He met Ed Yun, who had worked at Fender, Sir, and Guitar Center Corporate, as well as managing Guthrie Govins Bank, the aristocrats. Together with Yun, they started to plan the growth of the company and to negotiate with Korean manufacturer World Music International to build the first production Bowden guitars. Batches of the new guitars shipped to quality control and setup shops in Japan and the U.S., which was really code for the garages of Shunkina and Ed Yun by the end of 2014. Pliny had been in touch with Ola early on. He was able to get his first Bowden 6 from Ola, a Koa Top Custom. Pliny would use that guitar on the video for his tune, Ko Key, filmed in his bedroom studio where the tune was written and recorded. It was released in December of 2014, and to date has had more than 1.8 million views. By the beginning of 2015, Ola had had to quit his day job to focus 100% of the time on Strandberg guitars. The production Bowden OS guitar line was a huge success globally. Ed Yun left his role at Guitar Center, and his garage became the warehouse and center for quality control for Strandberg guitars in North America. The setup operations in Japan were expanded as well. Due to demand, a Strandberg custom shop was also set up in Japan. By 2016, production of the Bowden guitar was going full stream in Korea, and to be less dependent on a single supplier, they started to produce guitars at Yakko in China. Part of this decision was driven by the fact that this larger builder was one of the only paint shops in the world that could do a convincing swirl finish. This is actually all related to how I first became aware of Strandberg. I saw a video on YouTube of this extraordinary player, Per Nilsson, from Scar Symmetry and later with Meshuga, improvising on eight string Strandberg. Nilsson had been working with Ola for some time to develop a signature guitar. They wanted it to both be affordable but also feature a swirl finish. The platform developed from the Per Nilsson Singularity signature guitar went on to become the classic line of guitars with solid bodies, pickguard mounted pickups, and controls. On the 1st of January 2017, Strandberg Guitars USA Incorporated was officially open for business. Guitar Center had expressed an interest in selling Strandbergs, and this, along with the growth in sales, made it clear that a more formal U.S. base was needed. The full range of the production Bowden line was announced and shown in six, seven, and eight string styles. With all the ergonomic details of the custom guitars, they were all incredibly light, about five pounds each, varying only slightly by model. The models were designated as the original, prog, fusion, metal, and classic. All the guitars feature the patented Endure neck. All the necks are multi-scale and have softly fanned frets with longer scale lengths on the low strings than the high. The frets are all stainless and these certainly contribute to the clearness of the tone. 
Prague Fusion Metal and Original Lines have chambered ash bodies with flame tops. The classic model guitars have solid ash or alder bodies and are painted finishes. The fretboard wood varies with each of the body woods. However, during this time, the variety of production models had decreased the differences between production and custom shop spec guitars. And there was a decision to close the custom shop and focus on building the best possible production guitars. It was clear that with the further increase in production, a new overseas partner would be needed, and they settled on another Korean company, PT Court, that had manufacturing in Indonesia. At the factory, Court was producing 65,000 guitars a month, many for well-known production guitar brands, including Fender, DRS, and Chapman. A new dedicated product line was established under Quartz R&D department to give full attention to the complexities of building the boat design and to ensure continuity. After a short ramp-up, all overseas production was moved to Quartz. Basically, this has over 1,200 MIDI files that can help you make chord progression. So for example, if you look here, they've got every single C on the wrist, so it's C major, which is also A minor, B flat major, which is also B flat minor. And they've got every chord that is in the court. The 2018 NAMM show saw the introduction of the Salem model, a tribute to the iconic Fender Telecaster. The name is taken from the town in northern Sweden, which hosts the Swedish Championship of Country Music Competition. And yeah, it really is such a thing. The sailing comes in four different combinations of body and fretboard woods, each with slightly different tonal characteristics. Early on, many models used Sir or Fishman pickups, but the pickups on a classic guitar were designed in-house at Strandberg in cooperation with well-known pickup designer Michael Frank Braun, who had worked with the Fender Custom Shop and had designed pickups for Eric Johnson and Guthrie Govan. Strandberg launched the Standard line in 2018. They have solid basswood bodies with flame and quilted maple tops and they're available in various pickup and bridge configurations in six, seven, and eight string models. The biggest news from Strandberg in 2019 is the introduction of the long-promised bass line. Ole's been working on the hardware to build basses since 2009, and he himself had built the prototype, the last instrument to be built in his garage workshop back in 2015. But it took four more years to get them into production. The Bowden bass was a huge draw at the 2019 AMP show. There were two bass models introduced, the original and the Prague each in both four and five string models. They have the now familiar Endurneck, stainless steel frets, and both bases have chambered ash bodies with a solid flame maple top and weigh about seven pounds, 20 to 30% lighter than most other bases. They have the roasted maple necks, of course. The Prog model has an ebony fingerboard, whereas the original model has a maple fingerboard, and the electronics on the original yield the tones that are clearly a nod to the classic J bass. Also in 2019, the new neck through guitars and the Bowden TT, or True Temperament guitars, were introduced. NAMM 2020 saw the production release of the new neck through design in both the original and Prog series guitars. Also in 2020, there's a new Singularity guitar for Per Nilsson. Basswood body with an ash top in both 7 and 8 string guitars. They have slightly thinner and more rounded version of the Endure neck. There was also a new Pliny model guitar shown with a new set of Pliny signature pickups and the neck through design. Ola said Pliny had been pushing for a neck through model for a while. And they also launched new fretless bases. The fretless bases are still multi scale, with fret lines made of aluminum lead that glow in the dark. For me, the stainless frets have been a revelation. Since I tend to like warmer sounds, I quickly realized that I could roll off the tone control while maintaining definition on my Strandbergs. I use a slightly customized set of 10 strings on my Strandbergs 11, 14, 17, 26, 36, and 46. With the multi scale system, find that this set yields very consistent tension, and the flat radius, fingerboard, and excellent fretwork allows me to set up the action very low and clean. With two seated playing positions, lightweight and Durnak, the guitars are incredibly comfortable to play. I adjusted to the neck shape and softly fan frets in a matter of minutes. Despite being embraced by a prog and metal community early on, it certainly isn't my style of playing, and I've found the Strandbergs do everything I ask them to. Some members told me that they bought their Strandbergs because they wanted a guitar that travels well, only to have it become the number one guitar due to the ease of playing and low maintenance. I vividly remember when I got my Parker in 1996. I could literally play things on it that I couldn't play on my Archdale guitar. I've had the same experience with my Strandbergs. a couple years ago and now I have much more time to practice every day. But I've been playing guitar for 45 years, so my hands can get tired and stiff. 
I found that this is much less true with these ergonomics of these guitars. So though I smirked the first time I read their feel better, sound better slogan, that's turned out to be true for me. What's better than that? I need to thank my editor, Perry McManus, for taking time out of his busy schedule, lecturing his dogs about black and white movies, and contribute edits to the script. I need to thank Ola Strandberg for his permission to use photo and video clips. I also need to thank Per Nilsson for his permission to use his improvisation on the chord changes to Alan Holsworth's tune, Atavacron. If you haven't found Per yet, you don't know what you're missing. I need to thank... Even if you don't know chords at all, you don't know anything about music theory like me, this is perfect for you. And this is super good for you, especially if you like struggle with making melodies, chords, stuff like that. I've been messing around with it quite a lot, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Like you gotta hear how good this sounds. The unison MIDI chord. I need to thank Pliny for his permission to use his video clip for Co Key. If you have your own Strandberg story, please share it in the comments. Remember, if you want to further support these videos, stop by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug. The link's in the description. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Wire world. decade as a custom guitar builder, having built guitars for Carlos Santana, Ted Nugent, and Peter Frampton. By the end of 1985, a young Paul Reed Smith moved into a factory on Virginia Avenue in Annapolis, Maryland. He did this solely on the backs of orders he generated from a recent sales trip and on their success at the Winter Nam Show. That spring, they worked on the 20 or so guitars that they were prepping for the upcoming Summer Nam Show, and the first serial number instruments came off the line in August of 85. By that time, he had 18 people working at the factory. Now, in December of 2019, the RS employs over 300 people and produces approximately 1,800 guitars a month. How did PRS, in just 35 short years, become one of the big three guitar builders in the world? And how did the history of their flagship model, Custom 24, figure into that success? If you're as curious as I am, stay tuned, because this is the five watt world short history of the PRS Custom 24. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or mug to support what we're doing here. There's a link in the description. Any student of guitar history will recognize the construction principle of the iconic 50s Les Paul. By so many inspired innovations, idea is to use ball guitars, the standards, and Jerry Sunburst and Gold Tops were great guitars. He said, in my ears, junior specials, Les Paul sounded good. So did old Strats with Brazilian Rose with Board. really good too. The PRS guitar appeared in a market crowded with finely shaped hair metal guitars. Custom, as it was simply called, had a one-piece mahogany neck and what became known as a natural binding. Smith hadn't used the traditional plastic binding, instead opted for natural binding made through. Smith pushed away from the combination of Fender meets Gibson influences. said, took a strat shape and a junior shape and drew them on top of each other with lines, and that came out looking horrible. It was unusable, so I started on the new design. I worked very slowly, and it took about two years to come up. There were two guitars, and all the high guitar, and the one guitar. On the early price list, they listed the all mahogany guitar as the top guitar, and the curly maple top guitar as the Reed Smith Custom. Mahogany guitar became known as the Paul Simply The PRS model with the moon inlays was supposed
supposed to be a working man's guitar. It just so happened that most people wanted the curly maple top. There was a... Plus Hulu and ESPN Plus team up. Get him, I got him. <laughs> way rotary switch which gave you the full but also some coil sound that you might have found on a stratocaster and interestingly there was no tone control on the guitar this switch simulated the use of a 104 foot guitar cable as anyone that's looked at it refers to their adding cable between your guitar and amp adds capacitance effectively rolling off wireless system, and this was there to simulate the cable to the used to. The guitars had speed knobs that were connected to the now called PRS standard treble bass pickups. The next shape, pre-factory and early factory guitars, are very similar to the current pattern. And if you're curious about the new guitars of PRS, here's Fretboards on the early guitars were made of Brazilian rosewood, and they covered a single action. Indeed, the original Santana Commission had sent Smith tracking down everything he could learn about creating a Strat vibrato in Cuba. Generation 1 vibrato was the work of Smith and John Mann, an engineer and guitarist that Smith had met in 78. When Mann needed an SG that he'd received as a wedding present from his cousin, refinished, his cousin referred to Paul. screws used were stainless steel to eliminate corrosion. The vibrato arm itself is also a product of Smith's experience with three strategies. Screw and strap arms often broke off and over tightened, requiring an expensive repair. To avoid this, they designed a push-in arm. The early ones were simply lubricated to fit, but the later ones had Delray bushings and adjustments for air tension. The success of the system doesn't come down to just the vibrato itself. It also depends on the design which is made from a nylon teflon top. Locking tuners. Smith developed the tuners with Eric Pritchard. Together they developed the original wing collar tuners that were on the original guitars at NAM in 
mid 80s, Fender and Gibson's best efforts. <laughs> Shaping of the